Today's scripture reading is from Matthew 5, 10 through 12. It's page 4 in the New Testament of your Pew Bible. If you care to join. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. On my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Lord. So we're actually finishing up our series on the Beatitudes this morning, although uh, some of you remember that I missed one of the Sundays uh, with an emergency, and, uh, and so I'm going to come back to that in a couple of weeks uh, when I return from Costa Rica, so you'll, you'll get that missed Beatitudes, uh, but it's, it's coming. But today we're focusing on this uh, strange Beatitude, Blessed are the Persecuted. Hmm. Now I want you to imagine that you're in the market for a brand new car and you go and, and you go to the dealership and the salesman who is showing you that latest model takes you on a test drive and as you turn out of the parking lot, he launches into his sales pitch. He says, three hours in this car and your back will be so out of joint you'll need physical therapy to walk up right again. <laughs> and he said, the cost of repairs alone will in fact get my children through college. <laughs> and when you drive it down the street, every head will turn because everyone who sees you is going to be laughing at you. Now, of course, nobody who wants to make a sale would say such a thing. Doesn't make much sense. Which makes you wonder what Jesus was thinking when he uttered this final beatitude in Matthew 5. Thank you, Miguel. Miguel's telling me, turn your microphone on, Cliff. <laughs> Did all of you miss that in the back? <laughs> Could you hear it, Dave? Okay, good. Both Daves. Dave Jr. and Sr. back there. So it makes you wonder when Jesus was, what he was thinking when he uttered this strange beatitude in Matthew 5.10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, if this is a sales pitch, it's not a very good one. But Jesus isn't making a sales pitch in this beatitude. What he's doing is he's actually offering a word of comfort to the disciples who will, in fact, be persecuted because of him. He knows that no one, at least no normal person, likes being persecuted. So Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted in verse 10. And then in verse 11, he says, blessed are you... Because he's talking to those people who have already been persecuted. And then he says, don't be discouraged to those who have yet to face persecution. And he then says, by the way, don't be surprised. What he's saying in all of this is that he's serving notice to the disciples. Those who are going to follow Jesus faithfully should in fact expect a measure of rejection. Now I want you to notice Jesus does not say... Blessed are you if people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. What he does say is, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Not if, when. There's a tone of inevitability here. Now, it's certainly true that Jesus can bring people together, husbands and wives who have stop loving each other, children who are estranged from their parents, neighbors whose relationships have crumbled can all testify to the power of the gospel to heal. But friends, Jesus can also come between people. In Matthew 10, 34 to 36, Jesus gives us this warning. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be members of his own household. Some more tough words. 
These are sobering words for a church that would like to market itself to the world. You see, Jesus' words imply that opposition is an inescapable consequence of discipleship. And as much as we would like to fit in, we as followers of Jesus cannot help but to some degree to be out of step. If, our, if we are in fact faithful to our calling as disciples, the best we can expect is for people to actually respond to us as they would to Christ. And how did they respond to Christ? Slandered him, beat him, and killed him. Matthew 10 says, It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, the devil, how much more the members of his household? And John's gospel contains a similar warning. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus says to his disciples, If the world hates you, keep in mind they hated me first. This morning, a pastor friend of mine in Venice, Florida, her name is Robin Hager, is being targeted by the Westboro Baptist Church out of Topeka, Kansas. They are picketing her as we speak and share in worship this morning. Why? Because she is a female pastor. That's their reason. Who would have thought that persecution for being a follower of Jesus and living out God's call on your life was going to come from brothers and sisters in Christ? Jesus says those who are rejected for his sake should rejoice. And in this sense, rejection is actually a mark of God's acceptance, evidence that people may actually have caught a glimpse of Jesus Christ in you. Now that, that faith doesn't necessarily make it any less painful. It's only natural for us to want to be accepted, but Jesus' point here is clear. If we are faithful in following Jesus, we can expect opposition. And it may even come from those who are closest to us. So as we encourage each other in this truth, we also need to be careful. Because this blessing is, is only associated with a particular kind of rejection. And that's the second thing we need to notice about the beatitude. Jesus tells us when we should rejoice over rejection and when we should not. You see, rejection is a mark of blessing only, only when it is for the sake of righteousness. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. When does Jesus say that insults, persecutions, and slander are a means or a reason for rejoicing? Only when it is for the sake of righteousness. This is a very important clarification. Because there's a danger that we might misapply Jesus' words. Without this clarification, we might be tempted to think that it's a blessing anytime somebody insults us. If we fail to listen carefully to this beatitude, we may draw the false conclusion that every nasty thing someone says about us is a blessing. Friends, sometimes the nasty things people say about us aren't a blessing at all, they're just the truth. What's more, all that we call persecution really isn't persecution. Sometimes the behavior that we label as persecution is just a natural and a reasonable reaction to our own bad behavior. In such instances, people reject us for good reasons. They don't reject us because we're followers of Jesus. They reject us because we might be surly. They reject us because we might be petulant. They reject us because we might be hypersensitive and hard to get along with. The truth is that if we saw ourselves the way others see us, we probably wouldn't like us either. 
Now, there are some Christians who suffered in the last stock market downturn because, quite honestly, made some, they made some poor investment choices. I mean, there were really Christians. They are Christians, and they experienced some real suffering. There's no doubt about that. And some simply experienced that suffering as a result of a really crummy economy. Now, I'm not saying that God didn't have a purpose in that experience. God could have had a purpose for them. Maybe they needed to learn some financial lessons. But they were suffering either because they were poor investors or they suffered simply because they were living in a really bad economy. Often the things that we suffer are not directly related to our personal actions at all. The doctor diagnoses you with a serious illness. Your company downsizes and you get laid off from your job. In such cases, we're not suffering because we're Christians, but simply because we are living in the world. In Matthew 5, Jesus says the Heavenly Father causes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, there are some blessings in life that are simply a matter matter of common grace. Everybody experiences them. The sun rises on the good and the evil. But the converse is also true. There are some troubles that are also universally experienced. When Hurricane Katrina swept across the Gulf Coast in August of 2005 and the levees gave way, Christians in New Orleans were battered by the storm along with everybody else. And that suffering didn't come to them because they were Christians. It was simply a function of their location. A disease, a bad economy, a raging storm are all impersonal. When I suffer from these kinds of things, I'm not being singled out by some human agent. This kind of suffering that's mentioned by Jesus in this beatitude, the kind that he's talking about, is targeted suffering. In this, in this particular case that he's talking about, the tormentor has a face. The suffering has a name on it. But there are some cases where I'm not merely the target of rejection, I'm also the cause. Frankly, in, in our context where we live, here in the United States, here in this community, the reality is persecution is not the norm. This is a pretty easy place to be as a Christian. And so we have to ask a question when we believe that people have rejected us because of our faith. Is it possible, just possible, that there's something in our attitude or our behavior that might be contributing to the problem? Do you sense that people have rejected you because of your faith? Well, if you ask that question, if you sense that, then you might start with some soul searching. You might scrutinize your life and ask some hard questions of yourself and those around you. Is this really suffering for Jesus' sake? And if the answer is yes, then guess what? You should be rejoicing because Jesus tells us to. If you are being, being persecuted or suffering for the sake of Christ, then rejoice. Of course, that's easier said than done. But I think that's why Jesus also includes some motivation in this beatitude. He didn't just say that we'd be blessed. He told us how. He said we should rejoice because there's a return for our suffering. Jesus promises a reward to those who are persecuted and slandered for his sake. Rejoice and be glad, he says, because great is your reward in heaven. Now, his point is clear enough. But don't you think such a promise falls pretty hard on our modern ears? Might seem a little hollow to us, maybe even a little shallow. Feels uncomfortably like the kind of thing a, a bad employer might say. Somebody who wants us to work long, hard hours at a difficult job, but either can't afford or doesn't want to pay us much for our labor. 
The salary is not much, the employer admits, but the work itself is rewarding. Sounds sort of like working in a church, doesn't it, Tom Hamilton? <clears throat> <laughs> oh, and don't worry about it when people hate you and slander you because of me, because you're going to get a reward in heaven. In heaven? Is that all? How about a little reward right now? A reward in heaven's all very good, but the world in which I operate day and day uses a different category, a different currency. Reward in heaven is good, Jesus, but what can you do for me now? And I mean, why should I have to face these difficulties in the first place? Friends, when people reject us because we are followers of Christ, it is all too easy for us to be disappointed with God. Underneath such disappointment lies an underlying assumption that we are owed something more, something better for our devotion to Christ. And the fact that we are so little motivated by Jesus' promise says more about our vision than it does about the reward. Sometimes I think our view is too limited. We walk this pilgrim's path with downcast eyes so that all we see are the difficulties that are immediately before us. Perhaps one of Christ's designs in saying this is to compel us to lift our gaze to a wider horizon. There is great reward, he says, just not here and now. There is acceptance, but it may not be here and now. There is honor, but it may not be here and now. Now, for most of us, especially most of us in this room, the reality is persecution is the exception, not the rule. And Jesus' words are really a reality check for us. They're a reminder that this world is not our home. While we might have to endure some persecution, Jesus is clear that our reward comes later. The words are very clear. Rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven. We might struggle a little bit in this short life of ours, but the long-term reward is coming. The reality is that most of us here in this room aren't going to experience a lot of persecution in our life. But there are our brothers and sisters around this globe who are in the midst of it every single day. And let's make sure we're praying for them. They need it. They need our care and our support. Because they're living in the midst of that persecution moment by moment. Will you join with me in prayer? Lord, I pray for my friend Robin right now as her church, Grace United Methodist, is going through persecution right now by our own brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray for my brothers and sisters around the globe in places like Cuba and China and Africa where it is a daily struggle and a daily fear to live as a follower of Jesus. So, O oh God of peace, surround them with your love, with your care, and with your protection. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen.